Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit, and you might have noticed I've been doing a few interviews as of late, and that's because there have been a number of very interesting topics that have been brought up over the past few months that I think really need addressing. This is the sort of thing that I would love to discuss in detail, but I don't, frankly, have the qualifications to do so. Thankfully, I know somebody who does. Today, we're going to be talking about writing in video games, and we're going to be focusing on the idea of things like gender diversity and female protagonists and side characters, and who better? to bring onto the show than a BAFTA-nominated video game writer with a storied history in the industry, the one and only Ms. Rihanna Pratchett. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. Now, can you just give us a little bit of a rundown of your career in your own words, just to set the scene for our viewers? Ooh, okay. Um, so I've been in the industry about 16 years. Um, I originally started as um, a video games reviewer. I worked for the likes of PC Zone. That's where I sort of did my, cut my teeth um, in the industry, really, a couple of years on staff at PC Zone, and then did freelance for them alongside CMVG and PC Pro and uh, The Guardian and all kinds of places. And then about um, 12 or 13 years ago, I started moving over into um, development. So I'd gone freelance from, from PC Zone, which I think was something I always wanted to do. I was never that comfortable in an office. And I think I really wanted a sort of more pajama based job. I can um, relate. So, uh, yeah, I went, I went freelance from them and I, and I happened to be, be offered um, a gig doing uh, sort of a story editor work on a hardcore role-playing game called Beyond Divinity, uh, which was the sequel to Divine Divinity from the, the same same people that are now done. Larian, Divin I believe. Did, yes, yeah. Larian, who did um, Divinity Original Sin. So um, that was just fortuitous, really. I'd, I'd really enjoyed um, Divine Divinity, d despite the terrible title. And mm -hmm. they'd, they'd kind of remembered me, and they were looking for um, an, a native English speaker to just sort of work with, with their writer and the translated script, and just... Um, just polish it up and maybe do a little bit of original text and that kind of thing. And I thought, huh, this looks like uh, an interesting way to pay the bills. And so um, I did it and it put me off working off on RPGs for, for a very long time. <laughs> and then I sort of came out of it and I thought, huh, I, I seem to have found some kind of career here. And I wonder if I can get more of these things. Because at the time, people weren't really talking about games writing as a career. Obviously, people were doing it, but they weren't really allow allowing games writers out and about to talk to people. So they were sort of um, like kept in their dark room somewhere um, and not really kind of allowed to talk to press or in the, in the same way that they are now, certainly. Um, so I didn't really know what it was I was doing at the time. And so I just tried to get more work. So I went to some of my contacts whose games I really liked and said, hey, I'm, I'm doing sort of narrative work now. Let me know if, if you've got any work for me. And th that actually... <laughs> that actually uh, turned out to be quite fortuitous in that a couple of them had some um, some narrative, you know, needed, needed narrative help with a, a, a few of their projects. So I sort of started picking up work from there. And uh, after I did Beyond Divinity, I worked on Stronghold Legends, um, just doing mission dialogue. I did level dialogue for a SpongeBob game and a Pac-Man game. And that sort of gradually making my way up to my first... Um, big title which was Heavenly Sword on the PS3 and that was that was pretty exciting that was very kind of oh my career is sort of going up a <laughs> yeah. few notches here and then sort of you know the, on top of that it, and then it was sort of Overlord and Mirror's Edge and um, you know all sorts of uh, smaller roles and projects like Viking and I worked on Prince of Persia a little bit, I worked on Bioshock Infinite a little bit and of course um, Mirror's Edge which was uh, Mirror's Edge? <laughs> Tomb yep. Raider! Tomb Raider! That's the one! Uh, Tomb Raider that was out um, last year and I'm working on the, the uh, sequel. So that's where I, yes, that's where I am or how I got to where I am today. Indeed, and shockingly enough, that's not even all that you did. There's so many other games. Indeed, I enjoyed the writing of Overlord very much. The dark British humour is certainly obvious there. I believe you were both a writer and a voice director in some of those titles. Oh, yeah, I really enjoyed the Overlord games. So they were about as much fun to put together as they are to play, which is kind of rare for, for games development, actually. Um, they really were like tremendous fun to do. Um, I really like working with... Uh, both co-masters and um, the team at Triumph Studios and I made some good friends through doing it and it really was a very good working experience I worked very closely with the level designers there and with, with the actors as well and um, I voice directed the second game and, and co-voice directed on the first game and it was just 
it was just a it was just a blast really um and so i have a lot of love for the overlord games i mean they weren't they weren't big or, or shiny or, or triple a um although i think they sort of just tweaked over to to triple sort of a at least the first one did certainly because of, of press interest in it um but yeah it was just a tremendous amount of fun i think yeah, so I view those games as evil Pikmin with a distinctly British sense of humour, even though Triumph was, if I recall correctly, actually based in, in, the, Nether- in the Netherlands. But uh, uh, they... Yes, <laughs> they are. So I, I do remember a lot of the game originally being voiced in heavy Dutch accents, which was oh dear. Uh, quite, quite, quite amusing. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was just, it was just great. And, and obviously the, the Triumph guys have gone on to do um, you know, more in their Age of Wonder series and... Um, yeah, hope, hopefully some, there'll be more Overlord uh, adventures in the future. It would certainly be nice to see that. Now, you are known perhaps by many people primarily for the reboot of Tomb Raider and, of course, being the lead writer on Crystal Dynamics 2013 reimagining of Lara Croft. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about Lara. And firstly, uh, what were your chief concerns when being given the task of writing such an iconic character? Um, It's it's difficult to kind of think back because there, there's there's all been sort of concerns that come up and down during the development process and so it's hard to think back because we're, we're talking about four over four years ago what my concerns were at the time it was sure. um probably it was oh my god it's lara croft everyone knows who lara croft is even my mum knows who lara croft is oh i hope i can do a good job and then it was like okay now let's get down to trying to do a good job um because i don't think you can let the fear kind of um, ruled you um, so it was just kind of finding out what what crystal dynamics um, wanted for the character and what their vision was and it really appealed to me I think uh, delving into the more human side of Lara and de- delving into her at a time in her life that never really been properly explored before you know before she became the Tomb Raider and when she was sort of just out of university and you know think think she knows everything in the way you do when you just come out of university and so it was really kind of exciting point in this character's life i think um and i think actually the artwork was was a really big draw to me and i've always been really impressed by what um, brian horton and the team have done especially the concept art for for her um and that was you know i, I just sort of fell in love with it and I, I fell in love with all the concept art they've done because it's it's so beautiful and strong and characterful i mean it's very different to to what's gone before with lara but it's still i just love that sort of beautiful strength to it and it wasn't sexualized and but it was still had had that kind of beauty and it had that character coming through which i, I really like so that was definitely a big draw to me now, if you were given another shot at it and you were given infinite creative freedom and infinite time, is there anything you would have in hindsight actually changed in regards to how she was written? Um, not really Lara specifically. I think um, it would be fair to say the narrative team would have liked more space to develop the secondary characters. Like We, we ended up having quite a few secondary characters um, and just not enough space to, to realise them, uh, unfortunately. So... You know, we, we, we fell back on journals and things like that because there just wasn't very very much space. I mean, you kind of get, mm-hmm. um, in these kind of games, maybe an hour, 50 minutes to an hour of, of cutscenes. Um, and a certain percentage of those have to be given over to um, bookend, you know, bookending the kind of gameplay that surrounds them um, and reinforcing you know, where the player needs to go and what they need to do and the kind of gamey stuff behind games writing. And so you don't get a, that much of a chance to, to kind of have big emotional scenes in the same way you might do if you were writing a, a movie and TV. And, you know, many people argue that you shouldn't be doing that anyway. Um, but, yeah, I would have liked to have more, more time to, to uh, work on the, the secondary characters. I think we, we did what we could within the time available, but it, it was it was a, a, a tricky balancing act. Um, so I was... That, that was definitely one. Um, I think... As I, I mentioned before, I think the ramp up um, between one kills and lots of kills was uh, maybe too quick for a lot of people. Yes. And I think that, again, the narrative team maybe would have liked to... Have, we, we did sort of um, lobby to have that uh, be less quick. Um, 
But, you know, there is a lot of things to consider. And, and I think that's, this is important for, for games writing. And you're always balancing the needs of narrative and the needs of gameplay and the needs of the player um, to have a fun experience. So from the narrative standpoint, I think we would have liked more, more kind of a little bit slower, a bit more time to build it up. But we just given the players a weapon. Um, well, we were just given, given the players a gun, actually, because they had a weapon before in the bow. Um, but we actually spent quite a long time that first bit in the cave where she doesn't have a weapon at all. And that always feels a little bit anxious um, in a game when you've not been given a weapon. Um, I, even at, like at the start of Bioshock, um, I still feel anxious going around the first corner when I don't have uh, even a, a wrench to protect myself. And I know that nothing's going to hurt me and I know the wrench is going to be around the next corner. Um, but it still, it still ha you know, brings up that anxiety in me. And so we've gone for a while, we're doing that in the case with Laura with no weapon and then she got the bow and I know a lot of players really liked uh, the bow as a weapon because it felt kind of more Lara and a lot of them stuck with it and then it, then it was the first time she got a gun so we were definitely getting a lot of feedback from playtesters saying they, they you know, really wanted to use the gun after we'd given yes. them the gun um, but yeah I know a lot of people found it found it a very sort of quick ramp up and I think narrative kind of recognised that but there, there were a lot of factors to be juggled for that I think yeah, I mean, what you're describing is what many people call ludo narrative, the yes. compound of ludology and narrative, of course. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, do you do you often find those kind of restrictions frustrating? Because you did mention that, yeah, if you give the player a gun, then well, they expect to use it, and ultimately, Tomb Raider is an action adventure, and the action element of that will often involve the you know, the killing of many nameless dudes who oppose your way. Is that something that you personally, as a writer, often find frustrating, or is it simply something that you you learn to work around? because this is a, a very different medium to the more traditional non-interactive writing. It, it's a little of both, really. I, I think you find you can find it frustrating, um, but also you, you kind of have to learn to, to pick your battles um, and because you you, know, you you are you know part of the process and there are a lot of there are a lot of departments who you know want their want their say on things and obviously gameplay is king and so you're you're trying to sort of support that. Um, so yeah, it's, you, you kind of have to learn the, the, where your boundaries are and what you can push back against, I think. So, um, there's a lot, and, and learning how to communicate very gamey stuff in, in a, in a natural way. And there, there is a sort of real skill to be doing that. Uh, I, um, and, and then every now and then I, I go back to Barks writing, like I did a lot of Barks writing for, um, Bioshock Infinite and it's quite good, um, it's quite good, te you know, testing ground. Like if you really want a challenge, <laughs> go and write barks because <laughs> you're you're basically having to write twenty ways of saying shoot him or he's over there or, or reloading yes. or these ridiculously gamey terms that only ever exist in games and like no, I guess this nowhere else because they're nuts. You know, no, no. If you're in a firefight, no, your enemy is not going to tell you when they're reloading. Um, yeah, that's ridiculous. But it, it's it's sort of yeah, it, it's cropped up in games, but there there really is an art to writing. <laughs> those kind of things um i think it, it it's sort of being in early i think helps and being part of the process um and working with a narrative designer has, has definitely been been beneficial like um we got our, our narrative design on the first tomb raider maybe uh, just a year a little bit more than a year just before the end of um development and that was john stafford and i, I uh, wrote, wrote the game with john um, and that was that was really great because they, the narrative designer is like a conduit between the writer and the team, um, and they're predominantly concerned with the, the man mechanics by which the story is told, um, and so they're really helping the story to fit in with the team. And sometimes narrative designers are writers, and sometimes they're sort of more on the design side, and sometimes they are the writer, or sometimes they work with the writer. So that definitely helps um, smooth out the the kind of the edges. Um, and, and make the kind of connection between gameplay and narrative a, a little bit smoother. Um, but it is, yeah, it is very challenging. Um, and you, you have to find different ways of, of telling the story and, and you, you know, utilising things like um, you know, environmental storytelling and, and what, you know, mise-en-scene and, and um, secondary narrative and things like that. You've got to find all these different ways of telling a story that are not necessarily verbal. Um, and I think that's... A really interesting part of games as well in that you know you, you say 
know, we talk about games writers, but actually the word parts of games is, is only a sort of a small part of what a game writer does or should be a small part of what a game writer does. They, they should be involved with the design side of things, building the world, building out the characters, you know, just answering the why questions and, you know, trying to get the, the, the story to work within the gameplay and things like that. And so the word bits sort of come later, but we th when we say writer, we think of you know, writing and words. And I think that's caused a lot of um, problems for, for writing in games because people have, have sometimes been under the assumption that words are quick and cheap and they can just be slotted in somewhere down down the line in the development process. Whereas really what a game writer can do is is sort of, um, you know, is, is that, that important world building, is the character building, is the, the kind of narrative... Um, structuring which is which is very important and i think the more companies work with games writers the more they'll they'll see how useful they are outside the word bits as well as actually putting you know letters together in a pleasing order um so that yeah, part of the challenge is, is inherent in how games writers are used um and you know when they're used in the project and some fantastic information and uh, 20 years ago i certainly wouldn't have imagined anyone even having that conversation it's wonderful to see how far we've come when it comes to video games and actually putting a story out there so we're gonna dive into the subject of diversity in video games now mm -hmm. and this is of course going to be the, the main sort of focus of this interview and the role that writing has when it comes to uh, creating good female protagonists and side characters so uh, to set the scene, uh, based on the last few years, what do you think is the overall state of female representation when it comes to video game characters? Um, there's, I think there is good quality, there is not good quantity. Like, I think, by and large, when we have them and they're leading a game, they can be pretty good. Like, I, I think we've had some, some, you know, some good female lead characters. Um, and certainly some good female, some secondary lead characters as well who have also taken on more central roles in DLC like like Elizabeth in, in Bioshock Infinite like um like Ellie in The Last of Us uh and you know I like I really liked um uh, you know even though I had sort of um some qualms about the game um you know we had beyond two souls you know i liked elements of remember me um i think they were really kind of interesting characters and so i think 2013 um was was a good had a good quality level for for female characters both uh, as protagonists and secondary characters and, and a sort of mishmash of both but it just really didn't have the quantity so um remember me tomb raider and beyond two souls um they were they were pretty much the the only female led titles of the top um 100 selling games of 2013 now some of those games you know d didn't really have a female lead either they might have been kind of you know driving games or something that doesn't have a, a discernible lead or they could have been games that have um uh, gender choice um for example but those are the only three that had had female leads so yeah i mean i think we we do get do get some good quality it's just a shame that there, there really aren't more female leads out there and it puts a lot of pressure on the ones that are there um, already in, in that, you know, you know, Lara Croft or, or whoever, they they put a lot of pressure on poor Lara's shoulders and as a, as a result mine because there are so few that um, people have a lot of expectations and they want to see them, you know, some people want to see them represented in this way and another way and they're kind of almost expected to represent all kind of female characters in one which is really hard ask and it's not something like no one you know I, I mentioned in this past no one kind of asked how well Nathan Drake represents you know men um, but that in a way that they kind of ask about female characters um, and I've been definitely lucky that I, I, I've, I've worked on three female led um, titles so Heavenly Saw, Mirror's Edge and, and Tomb Raider um, and that's you know that's been really cool to, to have that um, you know, very different sort of stories um, and worlds, but to kind of, you know, what, by the time I came to Tomb Raider, I thought, yep, yeah, I've, I've kind of got, I've got the knowledge here. I've, I've done, <laughs> I've done the work. Um, I've, I've got that sort of the background. I, I know how, I, I know how to do this. 
Um, and that was because of things like Heavenly Sword and, and kind of working on that and, and Mirror's Edge and helping build that out, that world out through through the through the game and the comics. Um, so I yeah, that's it. We I, that's how I sum it up really. That we we have we have some quality. Um, it's just the quantity is and it's really it's really sad to hear stories. Um, for example, the the Remember Me developers who were talking about not you know how hard it was to get a deal with a female lead and you know i hope the success of things like like tomb raider for example do convince people that actually you know players like female leads and male players like female leads as well as female players i mean it, it's it's what's sold about seven million or something like that and it's like you know that those weren't you know all to, to, to female gamers that was you know it, it was very attractive i think to some female gamers and certainly i get a lot of um letters and emails from from female gamers that really enjoyed it, but equally as many as, as male gamers as well. So, I mean, I hope it would help, but yeah, it's, it's so depressing to, to hear those kind of stories. And, 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 you know, I think it's really sad to, to hear stories, um, not only about how, how difficult it's been for developers to um, get a female-led title into production, but also I think Penny LK did a report um, a, a couple of years ago which was looking at the marketing budget behind female and male-led titles and found that, um, female-led titles weren't selling as well, but they were getting 40% um, uh, less of the budget that, that male-led titles were. So it's sort of like, it's just been a self-fulfilling prophecy, really, um, because you're not... If you put the marketing in, then they will sell more. If you don't put the marketing in, how do you expect to make them sell more? So it, that was just, um, a, you know, a little bit disheartening to see. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to see more more female-led titles, um, and I do think we are getting um, a few more titles that have you know, gender options, and I think that's really, really good as well. Sure. So you brought up a lot of issues there, which is good because I was prepared for that. And we've got a number of questions I'd like to dive into on some of the specifics. Now, the first thing that you brought up, which I found interesting, of course, was the idea of the marketing budget and also the comment about Remember Me. Now, the developers Remember Me did claim, as you mentioned, that they found it hard to get a publishing deal. Simultaneously, that game was also, I wouldn't say critically panned, but it was not well reviewed. I mean, I recall critiquing that game and I didn't find problems with the characters. I actually found problems with the overly linear gameplay, the way that the combat worked, and the idea that the most interesting mechanic to that game, which was the memory remixing idea, the idea of being able to change somebody's memory and make them believe a different thing, was limited to only four instances within the entire game. Now, firstly, what I'd like to ask you is, do you believe that at the moment major publishers consider female leads outside of iconic characters such as Lara to be a commercial risk? Um, I think that may well be the case. Um, I know that Penny Arcade did a report um, not long ago uh, which suggested that female-led titles got 40% um, less of the budget that, that male-led titles got. And um, as a as a, a consequence, or uh, those female-led titles didn't sell as well. Um, so it you know became a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't put the marketing budget behind a title, it's not going to sell Absolutely. as well. Uh, and so you know that was that was really depressing to hear. And it was very depressing to to hear that that you know the the Remember Me guys um, were you know getting reports that female lead was was a problem. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I hope that um, you know the success of Tomb Raider. Yeah, we'll, we'll encourage others to, to look at female leads. Um, you know, there are female, you know, a female lead problem in other entertainment um, fields as well. That you know, that you don't get a huge amount of female-led, um, you know, action movies either. Um, you know, the female-led titles tend to be in in certain genres more than others. Um, and so, games is certainly not the the, the only entertainment medium that, that has this issue. Do you believe that it has uh, that problem more so than other particular mediums? Because you did mention there the, the action movie genre, and of course games have genres as well. And we do seem to have a, a lack of female leads in action titles comparable to the number of male leads that we have. But we also, of course, have point-and-click adventures and RPGs sure. and even things like dating simulators. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think the, the problem is on a genre-by-genre -genre basis? Is it comparable to other mediums? 
Um, I think that there are more sort of female leads, um, certainly in um, indie games and um, adventure games, um, and probably the games that don't get as much uh, PR and budget and, and not as many people are aware of them as they are the big kind of ma- male-led games. Well, obviously with RPGs you, you get a, a gender choice, um, and so I, I know that's a, something that, that's very important to a lot of gamers. Um, so I think there is a... a, a genre factor in it um but also you know we, we can sometimes find that, that secondary female characters can be a bit undercooked and things like that and you know they don't don't really sort of populate the world in the way that male characters do um, and we just haven't had you know we haven't had our orange is the new black um game we haven't had that it's great that games. you brought that up i i've brought that up repeatedly just saying look if this is this was such an interesting series to me because the perspective is entirely different. And could we have a video game that did that? That would be lovely. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because certainly some of the, the, the feedback I've had from, from gamers, uh, from male gamers in particular, taking on the role of Lara and, and some of the things that she goes through that, that do have, um, you know, a slight gender element to them, you could say. But, you know, being being put into a situation where you're feeling sort of un- under threat by, by a male character, for example... You know, I've had reports that that gave them a perspective into you know being a woman that they they never actually conceived of before and would never get in real life. And I thought that was kind of incredible. I mean, we didn't especially put that in for that to to give male gamers that perspective, but it was just you know that that really shows you the power of games that that they are a you know at heart they can be a really empathic medium. Um, and that that's one of the one of the things I love about them. But even on TV, like. Orange is the New Black felt like a game changer. It felt like, you know, we are see- we are seeing something that's go- you know, it's going to change things. It's going to change the way that, that people feel about female-led series, about female-led characters, about um, females in the criminal underworld, all sorts of things. And it was so sort of well put together and, you know, it was, it's so enjoyable. And, and you know, the, the ending of uh, season two was a real kind of punch the air oh, yes. type of moment. It was like, my God, that is the way to do TV. Um, and in some sense, TV tends to be the more progressive medium, I think at the moment, even, even more so than films. So I think there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot that, that games can take from, from TV storytelling in particular about character creation. And, that, you know, they really put a lot of work into their character creation because, you know, it's the characters that, that drive the stories. And often that there isn't um, that much time and effort put into the characters in games. Um, and I think when you do put that time and effort in and you do think about you know, the, the characters from from the ground up and you know their backgrounds and you know even what their pets are called or their boats or their sisters or you know where they grew up and how they grew up and you answer all these questions you end up getting much more interesting um characters as a result of that um and so i think if anything things like uh orange is the new black and and you know luther for example luther had a very good amazing secondary female character and um and a psycho female character as well and that that was uh uh you know she was she was called alice if you i don't know who's seen it um but you know she she was really great as well uh and so there's been some really great female characters either in secondary roles or all kind of leading tv shows that so i think that games can can learn a lot from from their construction um but yeah it feels like we're still quite a long way off from getting it like the, the uh, gaming equivalent of, of Orange is the New Black. Um, but I really want to see it. I really want to see yeah. it. I really yeah, want to be behind that. So if like any developers out there doing anything like that, call me. <laughs> you know, I am all over that. Now you bring up uh, yet more fantastic points here. So of course we're going to dive into them one at a time. Now, Orange, uh, the comparison with Orange is the New Black is is a very interesting one to me because I know of a great great deal of my male friends we all enjoyed that series, and that was a series where the characters were predominantly female and were also dealing with predominantly sort of female issues, and yet we enjoyed the series anyway. We had no problems with that, and indeed it did provide a very interesting perspective. It made it different, and it made it stand out from other uh, other f- series in that particular genre. Now, when it comes to games, do you feel that gamers have a strong desire to relate to the character that they're playing or the characters they're playing alongside? And to what degree do you think this also applies to the gender of said character? I think 
it's, it's again it's about human empathy i mean you know you you enjoyed uh, the characters and the stories in Orange is the New Black um, because they were interesting stories about human beings. They would still be interesting stories if they were about male characters. Um, they were, you know, they just had an extra dimension, and and um, and certainly the gender does uh, add an extra dimension to those characters um, because you know we want to empathize with with other humans you know it's a commonality of mankind we, we kind of it doesn't really matter about gender it's about you know life experience and and kind of empathy and understanding and we're, we're kind of seeking to you know understand our, ourselves and the world and our friends and our partners and it's kind of not necessarily always gender-based it's just about um being captivated by 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 kind of human struggle and hu human endeavor and um human triumph i think which is is what um uh, oranges and new black really encapsulates i think you know I, I have many male friends that that kind of love that and they love that because there was it, they were great stories and great characters and they would have been i i'm not sure if they would have been as great if they were male because i think you know the fact they were female added a new um, dimensionality to them in the same way that Ripley being female in the Aliens franchises added a new dimension to her character and was something that they could you know they could play on with the maternal instincts between sort of um, Ripley and the alien queen and Ripley's relationship with Newt and Ripley's later relationship with her own kind of alien baby um, and you just wouldn't have got that if it had been a male character which is what Ripley was in intended to be and so it's it would be disingenuous to say that gender doesn't play a part in that, but at the, at the root, it's it's human stories, um, and that that's kind of where you have to focus. Um, but I still think you you could tell in, there are plenty of, of game stories out there that you could tell in just as interesting, if not more, way with a female character heading them up. And sometimes it's just a case of, of you know sitting back and thinking okay what well, what would this be like if this was a female character if this this was a mum character instead of a dad like we're getting a lot of dad dad games at the moment with lots of sort of you know paternal and father issues um embedded in them and it's like wh where are the mum games where are the like the, the the sort of uh you know the the kind of equivalent relationship between um you know if, if booker had been a mum who had lost her 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 daughter or her son in in um, uh, a similar way would that, that have how would have that story have played out? We don't tend to see the mums, um, and I think there's a really in, you know I think there's interesting stories to be told there. I really want would like to see more mum protagonists. I'd like to see more you know older female protagonists. We're still very very narrow in how we depict both our male and female characters, so they're often you know very very much the same age same ethnicity, same um, sexual orientation, you know, same ability and things like that. And you know, there's so much more we can do, we, you know, a, a game with, with a character in a wheelchair, for example, there, there's, there's such a, a lot of um, kind of rich sort of gameplay and narrative to be had from that. Um, or, you know, characters that, you know, diff <laughs> different, you know, manifestations of love, for example, like, um that certainly sort of played a part in um heavenly sword it, you know i was focused a lot about the the, the love which is a a familial love with a, a sisterly love that that um nuriko felt for kai and that was her driving motivation was was to um create a future for for her adopted sister um and that was you know and, and so so often um female characters relationships tend to to be with other characters it's male and female love and and kind of that's what you get and there's there's so much um rich tapestry of human relationships and and you know uh human connections and human endeavor that that's there for the taking and i, I don't Certainly. feel that the, the games industry is really embracing that yet yeah it's, it's interesting that again you, br you bring all of these uh, things up because when i talk about heavy rain for instance a lot of people really didn't like heavy rain but I found that it resonated with me to some degree. The idea of uh, having your ch your child be abducted or even just losing your child in a shopping mall as you do in the opening scene is is terrifying to a father, of course. And that, that resonated 
with me quite well. And of course, Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons, which I truly believe to be the the best example of Ludo narrative of all time, uh, was very, something that resonated with me as well because I, I have a brother, and of course, you know, I have a. a, a a bond with my parents that was very positive and uh, I can share the motivations of the character there. But there were a few interesting things that you pointed out and I, what I'd like to talk about is the differentiation between the characteristics of male characters and female characters. You mentioned that the gender adds an extra dimension to the characters in Orange is the New Black, but mm -hmm. I'd like to look into exactly how it does that. You know, what would be to you the kind of characteristics that a well-written female character would display, and how would they be differentiated from what a well-written male character would display? Um, I mean, there, there's definitely some similarities. Um, for example, if you look at... Um, the relationship between Sam and Lara in in the game and in the comics as well. It's it's a very female relationship. It's it's very supportive. You know, there's a tactile element to it. Um, the the kind of way they talk to each other is is kind of quite female. They're, they're sort of they share things. They're they're, they're quite emotional. They're they sort of not afraid to hug and and things like that. And it's a very female friendship. And um, you know, there the, there are different ways that you interact. That, you know. For me, I find there are different ways that I would interact with my female friends and my male friends. And, you know, I, I had a, you know, I was having a very hot, you know, co deep uh, conversation, kind of trauma and angst with another female friend. And, you know, at di different points in the conversation, she took my hand or I took her hand and, and you know, just being kind of there for each other. And it was a sort of, it was quite, a fem felt like a very female expression of um, support. Uh, and that was kind of, something that I kind of built in with, with Laura and Sam to a degree. I, I drew upon my, my female friendships for that and, and sort of you know, the way female friends talk to me or how I've noticed them talking to others. Um, and so it wasn't just, uh, you know, a friendship. There was that there was a, a definitely a female element to it. Um, and I think in, in Orange is the New Black, I think the female element comes through just as, as partly a surprise in that we've not really seen um, female characters in the underworld to this degree um, as much. I mean, you've seen, you know, for example, Snoop in The Wire, for example. Um, but this was kind of full of characters with, with really interesting stories. Um, and I think, you know, gender did play a part in it, in, in um, how they were kind of moving through society, how they were treated by others. Uh, as a consequence of that, and, and gender did play a part in that, um, because it, it, it plays a part in how kind of women move through society and how they're, they're talked to and perceived and stuff, and that and so that, that played a part in it. Um, but it also sort of, I think it took a delight in, um, you, you know, being female, and it showed um, lots of different sides of it. And I, one of the things I really liked about it is they used lesbian actresses to play lesbian characters. They used a transgender actress to play a transgender character, um, and that that and it that's so important. Like you, you know, I, I like the Dallas Buyers Club, but I I I didn't want to see Jared Leto play a, a, a transgender character. I wanted to see a transgender actress play a transgender character, um, and you know I think that that was something very important about it as well. I mean, at its root, it is about kind of human stories. But I think it is important, um, you know, as, uh, especially for young women growing up, seeing this representation around them um, and seeing interesting female characters. And that's not the same as good. And that's not the same as nice. Yeah. And I think that's something that the Orange is the New Black did really well. They were interesting and they were textured and they weren't necessarily nice or good or, or you know moral compasses for men which are often um how female characters tend to be in um tv shows where they're kind of male-led and that is there is that dodgy kind of moral compass uh aspect to it um for example in in the sopranos and even though um i actually quite like the female characters they were often sort of moral compasses for men so you know a, a show that sort of um uh, throws that out a bit is Nurse Jackie, which I, I really like, and I really like Edie Falco, um, and and you know that and, that and that in that way they sort of use men as a moral compass for for women, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah, and I think it is about 
I think they they broke away from the, the kind of the nice, uh, kind of good moral compass kind of female characters, and I think it was really appealing to see um, their their struggles and their stories, and you know, they still have even some of the worst characters have that element of relatability to them, and I think the, the kind of uh, the prison genre certainly has a it's got all your stories built in. So I I love the the depth. And the texture of the characters, and and you know you, the fact you can kind of love the uh, the bad ones as much. For example, like V is a horrible, uh, Absolutely horrible awful person, person. <laughs> but a really interesting character. And I think that's the sort of uh, thing I'd like to see. Like, for example, I, I spoke about how I would like to see a female character in the in the GTA world, and it's not because and look, it, it has nothing to do really um, with the way female characters already treated in the GTA world so much as it is to do with I really want to see a female character in that kind of underworld setting because it can absolutely be done um I think Orange is the New Black is proof of that but there's also you you know there's certainly a female element to criminal underworlds you know existing right now and there's so much to kind of draw upon I really wanted to see a a female character negotiating that world um, and, and kind of what kind of stories that might bring up. And I just thought that was really interesting. Um, and especially as the, as the last game was about shifting perspectives. Um, you know, the gameplay was literally about shifting perspectives. And I, I just would have liked to have seen you know, one of those characters be a female character for that interesting shift of perspective. Um, and, you know, you de- they, don't, they don't have to be nice. They don't have to be good. They don't have to be someone's girlfriend. They can just be, you know, a, a, a really interesting kind of textured not particularly nice but you know a joy to to kind of watch and to play character yeah now you brought up a, a point about uh, actors specifically lesbian actors playing lesbian characters and so on and so forth and i'd love to ask you a question about writers and relatability but before i do that there's one i want to toss in just off the mention of being nice female villains now some of the most iconic female characters of all time have been some of the most villainous characters of all time i i often point to shodan from mm-hmm. system shock 2 as being just one of the most terrifying antagonists that have ever been written for video games and, and uh, you know, glados from, from portal yeah and... absolutely I, do you think the the state of female characters as villains is something that's currently working out and if not, is there anything that, if you were writing a, a female villain, is there anything that you would perhaps add to it to, to really bring that extra dimension? I mean, I think, as you say, the ones that are out there are being done done well, and I think that's, that's something to point out, is that when female characters are being done, they're being done quite well, usually, if they're in that lead or secondary character role, but I think that's something that's been... Um, you know, that's taken a few years, and certainly 2015, uh, th- 2013 was was a particularly good year for it, I think. Um, and it felt like we, you know, things were improving. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I love a good female villain. I love a good female villain as much as a as a female protagonist, really. And but I like to see the inter. Really, I want to see the intersection between the two. I like to see kind of you know female characters, female leads with a dodgy moral com- more <laughs> with a dodgy moral compass, and, and you know, in line with men and. Um, who are you know going through, uh, you know have heavy stuff and you know are dealing with that as as you know part of the gameplay. Again, I I you know I, I do think the um, the GTA world is incredibly rich. Um, it's, it's it's you know it's very fun to play. And I just I you know I just wanted to see see kind of a female character in that world because it was I just thought it would lend you know so much to it and it would be something that it hadn't necessarily been seen before. Yeah, I think you're probably um, right on that one. And you know it would have been a good experiment for them because they wouldn't have it wouldn't like it wouldn't be a female led game because um, you know it would be one of one of three leads right so so it would it would have been probably a safe experiment for them um, but yeah I think it's just um, thinking about female you know thinking about the uh, your lead character and thinking actually let let's have a look just playing some exercises like what if they were female what if they were in a wheelchair what if they were a different ethnicity or or different um sexual orientation um different abilities uh and it's just kind of playing around with things and that sort of stuff writers do all the time um but isn't necessarily um what games developers do all the time and so it's sort of when you get writers more involved they can start thinking about hey have you you know just maybe all maybe we should not make all our characters white or maybe we could 
you know, thinking about changing, you know, this character to a female character, maybe that could bring something interesting to it. Um, and it's something that, that kind of Hollywood does all the time, and they often take, you know, will take a story um, and reverse the genders and get a completely different story out of that. For example, if you take something like Wall Street, reverse the genders, you've kind of got Working Girl, for example. Um, and, you know, it's just about playing with, with kind of ideas and characters and, and different ways um, of, of, you know, <coughs> representing diversity. And it's, de- it's that kind of nature of, of playful creativity, I think, that um, probably the industry needs some more of. Mm. Now, some have claimed that writers merely write what they know. So that means that if the majority of writers in video games happen to be male, the chances are you're going to have the majority of video game characters being male and that there will be a struggle to write good female characters. Now, do you believe that this assertion is actually true? And I'd love to know how you go about writing characters which you don't necessarily relate to. Um, I don't, I don't think gender should necessarily be a barrier to not relating to a character. I mean, I think, um, you know, I know, I know we were, were um, mentioned a while ago, I was talking about the, the Gamma Sutra article that was um, uh, written by, uh, I think, I can't remember the gentleman's name, and I'm very sorry, you might have his name, because um, I know I, I sent the article to you, which was talking about the fear involved with um, writing characters outside his his gender and ethnicity, and I thought that was a really uh, interesting, honest piece. And I think it's probably something that a lot of um, developers do worry about, and especially in this particular climate at the moment, where where um, you yeah, know the, the the press is very um, hyper aware of of gender issues, and lots of things are being brought up. And I do worry that sometimes developers think, okay, I'll just do what I know. I won't. I won't. Um, stray outside the boundaries of, of what I know because um, you know I might get it wrong and that, and that fear of kind of getting it wrong but it's sort of just relaxing about it a bit um, and it's sort of kind of getting to know people I mean I don't have any fear of I'm not a man I have absolutely no fear of writing men because I kind of you know I, understand people or oh, I you know I understand different people I talk to men I, I, I you know I was raised partly by a man like I, I I know men that helps you know I read I kind of understand narrative um I, I talk to people I, I kind of understand again that that commonality of mankind it's finding the things that connect us and not thinking about you know the differences but thinking about okay what what connects us as human beings um, and I think if you can stop thinking about gender and start thinking about those human connections and then kind of think about gender later on and thinking, OK, if this, if this character was female, what might that add? Um, and, you know, just re- you know, speaking to women and uh, reading about women and watching women. I and mean, that, uh, that sounds kind of creepy, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's how you, you kind of under, you have to understand human beings, I think. And that, you know, a writer is someone who seeks to understand human beings, regardless regardless of what gender gender they identify as. They just understand the human beings and what links us as human beings. So, um, you know, I think gender adds a dimensionality to that. Uh, But I don't think, you know, by and large writers, you know, professional writers, you kind of get over that pretty quickly. um, And you just you know you you kind of you're always thinking yourself into the different positions you are always going to the dark places because that's what writers do you know you're always exploring the the, the things that that aren't you and maybe the things a little bit you that you would rather not admit but you know you that's what you do you explore these possibilities in your head um and you kind of read and you absorb and you 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 read books and news and fiction and non-fiction and you just kind of start to understand a little bit about this kind of crazy world and so it's sort of as as you kind of grow as a writer i think you lose that um that fear uh, and i think it is actually better to try and not get it completely right than not to try at all i know some would kind of disagree on that but i think it's uh, if you are worried about it i think it's about saying okay let's take gender out of it this this like think of an interesting human story here and then maybe sneak sneak gender back in and just play around with things um and that's you know that's that's kind of what writers do yeah the article you're referring to was actually written by ryan henson Crichton, 
and it was reposted from the Untold Entertainment blog, and I'll put a link in the description below this video for those who wish to read about it. It was actually related to his uh, uh, the game The Journey Down, which has some very mm -hmm. interesting character design indeed, and uh, you can go and read up more on that, and I would certainly recommend it. So, plenty more questions, not so, many so, not so much time to ask them, unfortunately, but we'll get as many done as we can here. Sure. Now... Statistically, uh, men seem to be the majority of core gamers in genres such as first-person shooters, action adventures, and to a lesser extent, RPGs. Do you believe that a larger female demographic could be brought into these genres through writing, or are there simply too many other factors which are skewing the gender balance at the moment? I'm not sure if it was just if it would be just writing. Um, I think there are a certain percentage of female gamers that are attracted to games with female leads. Um, I mean, definitely given with uh, Tomb Raider, and that there are there are some that you know just don't care about it, and there's some that you know. I personally, you know, I like to support games with female leads because I wanna, um, I'd like to see more of them, and that's my way of kind of voting for more of them is, yeah, is, is kind of you know buying those games, and. So I think it's not so much writing, but it's about character creation and um, you know, good storytelling. And I think that kind of attracts both genders, actually. But I, I think um, one reason why RPGs may be more appealing to certain female gamers is, is because of how seriously they take character and how seriously ta they take story. Um, I think it would be... I think playing... Around, I'd like to see more of this sort of... Me male heavy games like Call of Duty playing around with kind of female characters um, I mean these are all kind of fantasies these are all kind of um, di different permutations of fantasy and the fact we are kind of now getting females actually going into the front line of war in the real world um, and that they really sort of rarely pay play a part in fictional games and it's Is a sort bit of silly. like yeah, it's that when reality is kind of catching up with your fantasy, you really need to rethink your fantasy, I think. Yeah, I mean, and that's a very... Uh, you point out Call of Duty there, and it's an interesting thing because as of the last few games, you've been able to play a female in the multiplayer, and they're fully mm -hmm. customizable, just as capable. Different character models, different sets of animations, fully realized. And yet, I have noticed in the campaigns, which are historically badly written, I, I have to say, from the critic's standpoint... There is an obvious lack of female characters, even in the Ghosts and in Advanced Warfare, which are games that are set decades in the future. Yeah, and I think that's... Um, they're kind of missing a trick there. I mean, I really liked the character of Malik, for example, in, in Deus Ex, which, you know, they had a, um, you know, a male lead character and they had male secondary characters, but, but I really liked Malik's character um, and how she kind of interacted with Jensen... Um, and yeah, I mean that, uh, you know, you don't see, um, too many female characters in sort of the sci-fi sci genre either. And I know, you know, traditionally sci-fi has had a bit of a problem with that, both in female writers and in, um, female characters represented on screen. I think it is getting better, um, as is, as is the fantasy genre. Uh, but I know I, I really want to see kind of female leads in it. I'd love to see a female lead in a, in a COD game. I, I'd love to sort of play um, any of the female marines from Aliens in, in a kind of lead. It, it, it's sort of... Give me um, a Vasquez game. Just give it to me. Uh, you no, know, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I've, I've kind of uh, talked about that as well. I mean, she was... I mean, she kind of had a... She was a little one note, but it was so cool to, to see that kind of character in that kind of situation. And like she seemed by far the toughest in the Marines, and it was like that's who you want. That was who you would pick first if, if, if like going up against aliens was a sport. Yeah, no, she she'd be your first pick. Um, and you know, and I, I just would love to see that kind of thing explored. Um, I mean, I I, I just kind of love that there were different variations on on female characters in Aliens, and and I think. My love of the Aliens franchise has, has served me really well in games. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of grew up with female protagonists like um, Ellen Ripley and like Sarah Connor. So I kind of grew up as a little girl thinking that, like, 
fighting aliens and and killer robots from the future. I thought that's just what women did. Um, <laughs> so it was a bit of a shock. Uh, and it's kind of like that's what they should be doing in games because we can kind of create these 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 fantasies. And you know we can you know fill them full of interesting stories and engaging characters. Uh, so yeah, there's there's so so much that can be done. I think, and I think the, there ha- it does feel like the industry is sort of edging towards it, but it still feels that there's a certain level of caution. And I think maybe the the kind of hypersensitivity of of um, you know certain sections of the press at the moment with with kind of gender issues, you do see them a lot, and 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 you know that. It's it's good that these things are being raised, and sometimes it, it can feel like you know sometimes I agree with some things, sometimes I don't. I'm glad that they're kind of being raised, but I also think that you know as I said, maybe that's sort of making developers quite fearful, and and I worry yeah. that that's sort of putting them off. So it's sort of wanting to say, hey, you know that this this is easier to do than you think it is. Just kind of think about humans and human stories and what connects us, and then sort of fold gender into that. Yeah. Now- but, Sorry, uh, did you have a uh, point to finish off there? No, no. I, I mean, also, I think it is about getting more um, more storytellers involved as well. I think you know we we usually sort of quite fearless about that sort of thing, um, but you know because we have to be. That's 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 what we explore in our, our heads all the time, um, and so having writers and narrative designers and um, cinematic directors and people that understand story and character involved early on, I think that can actually make a big difference and it can help um, you know, people that maybe are not used to, to uh, you know, creating game narrative and, and characters. It can sort of you know, ease, ease them into it a little bit more and, and make them feel a little bit more, more secure about what they're doing. And, you know... <sighs> I think there needs to be more leaders than followers at the moment, and it just feels that like there's a lot of uh, sort of cut, you know, copy and pasting, cut and copy and paste from, uh, you know, various leads across the ages, and people kind of go with what's safe, and except that doesn't, that doesn't kind of progress things, and it doesn't necessarily progress things for your game either. Um, so yeah, I think there's still there's still a long way to go. I think we are getting better, um, and I think that. Um, you know, stor- storytellers becoming more involved in games early on, I think that will definitely help. Mm. Now, it's interesting that you brought up sci-fi, uh, because mm-hmm. the first thing that it jumps to in my mind when it comes to female characters in sci-fi and games would probably be Mass Effect, and yeah. also the fact that we talked about Vasquez of Aliens. Mm-hmm. Now, some critics lately, this has been something of a hot topic, have pointed out tropes which are often used with female characters in video games. Now, the trope that I'd like to talk about is the so-called Ms. Male, where mm-hmm. female characters have been criticized for supposedly being men in women's bodies, displaying overly masculine traits. Now, I'd like to first know whether or not you think this is common in video game writing, and secondly, if you think that's even a problem. (laughs) In in some senses, I just want to get them there. I just want to get them leading leading games. Um, It's... like I I like Aliens because, yeah, Vasquez is, is kind of... She is, in part... Uh, you know, a kind of a male character in a female character character's body, but that adds a certain, that adds a different dimension to it, and you do, you see her, um, you know, d- displaying kind of uh, you know empathy and, and supportiveness to other characters, and, and you know she, uh, you know she obviously has um, you know relationship with Drake, and that kind of the, the way that sort of plays out in a sort of um, little bit broski and jokes and, and things like that, and. Um, it is sort of that. That's kind of nice to see as well. And you've got you know the, the, like um, Pharaoh, and you've got Ripley, and you've got sort of different different shades of female characters within within there. And and um, so I think yeah, she she was a bit, but there were still little you know a few little kind of female uh, things coming through, kind of empathy and support. You are not you know purely uh female but i think you know there's possibly thought as being a little bit more female um what about uh, I, what about fem shep actually that that would be a good question to bring up because i know a lot of a lot of players myself included preferred playing the female version of shepherd uh, mostly because i preferred her voice actor frankly okay uh, yeah jennifer hale yeah i mean i've not i've not and it's my terrible shame i've not played the mass effect games um and i think 
I really want to, and I, I, I kind of get a bit scared. Like, do I have to go back to one? Can I jump in at two? Is that okay, or do I have well, to? Go you could it? probably jump in at two, honestly. Okay. They do a decent um, retelling. And, I mean, I don't. So I, I can't really speak to how much of the game is sort of, how much the game reacts to, to if you play a female character, whether there is any, any reaction there at all. I imagine there is some. A little, um, not much. I've got to be honest. I mean, I think that's. You know, I think being um, in, in a female character's body and having those kind of experiences, like, I, I do think that that gives you uh, a greater sense of empathy as a male player. And, you know, as I was saying about Lara, um, I, I kind of want to just see more women there and then we can kind of work out how to do them even better. And I want right, to, okay. to see more people trying and I want to help people try. I mean, I didn't set out in this industry to just kind of work on... on um, female-led stuff and that was purely you know absolutely coincidental that i have worked on three and that i got all these these jobs for vastly madly different reasons um and you know it's it but it feels it feels good to have helped bring those characters to the industry and i think um that that's you know there were definitely team efforts but it's it's really satisfying to, to be part of that um and it's really you know great to to have um, young women reach out to me and, and talk about how they've really enjoyed the, the work I've done on female protagonists and you know talking about narrative and things like that and, and you know it makes me think yeah it's important for for young women to see those representations around them in the same way it's important to young men in probably a way they don't necessarily realise um, and yeah I mean there's, a, there's a, that quote you know you can't um, you can't be what you can't see uh, and, you know, I, I think that that kind of representation is important. And I think there are a lot of male players like you that, that actually prefer playing um, female characters. And I've certainly heard of, of you know, if you, if you take something like World of Warcraft, like there, I, I swear, you know, most of those night elves were being played by men. They're probably, um, uh, probably. Um, but hey, what's wrong with that at the end of the yeah, day? No, no, I, no, no judgment, no judgment. Um, and but I, I think, like male gamers are, are much cooler and relaxed about playing female characters than maybe marketeers and, and developers think they are. Yeah, I uh, certainly wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, when I jump into a Dota game, I certainly don't quibble over the gender of the character. I quibble over how many things it's going to blow up. So <laughs> uh, what its gender is is not really relevant at that point. Now, if we have time for a couple more questions, I'd like to dive into one that is annoyingly taboo and i suppose as british people we're thankfully maybe a little bit more open to this than the americans are and that's related to sex and sexuality in gaming mm -hmm. in general and the fact that frankly it's been approached in a fundamentally clumsy and often cr cringeworthy fashion i i cannot think of a single sex scene in a video game that i haven't laughed at i'm gonna yeah. be honest whereas television and written media has been dealing with it quite comfortably for some time can you think of a reason as to what exactly is holding gaming back in that regard? Why is it that we can't seem to deal with sex in any more than a kind of pubescent fashion? Um, I think that's that's a really interesting question. I, I, I you know, and, and now thinking back, I probably feel the same way. I remember, um, like in Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. that sort of you know, those sex scenes oh, yes. in there. But I, you know, I have I have my issues with Fahrenheit, and and I feel somewhat burned. By so it. do many people. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think it's maybe because we're we're not so good at the bit before sex in terms of you know we're not great at the sex either. But um, the building relationships between characters yeah. and that kind of believable relationship between characters, and like it is sort of where does gate where do where does gameplay come into the sex part of it? Are we just sort of Hopefully leaving it never. to the cutscene? <laughs> it's like when they try and put gameplay into it, it always gets a bit, uh, it gets a bit weird. Um, but I think it's it's kind of building those relationships between characters. And I, I think sometimes um, the kind of narrative logic behind the, why these characters are having sex um, can sometimes get lost. Like I didn't, I, I you yeah, know, that again, that was something with, uh, that, that sort of Fahrenheit did and, um, especially since one of the characters was technically dead, it seems and seems like a bizarre um, state of affairs. Uh, yes. in, uh, you know, along with the fact that they actually managed to sire a child out of that union between a woman and a dead it, man. It, um, yeah, but well, that, I mean, that that, was just, I was, <laughs> I'm convinced the dog ate the script for that game halfway through. So yeah, it, it has some, it has some really brilliant parts, and particularly at the start. Um, and and brilliant at the beginning. It, it sort of I, I really wish that they'd just been able to repeat the. Um, 
the first half an hour <laughs> over and over again uh, in some way. Um, but yeah, I think it's partly because we're not d- good to uh, at um, depicting relationships, really, because we kind of need to get better at the characters and the relationships, and then hopefully we can get kind of better at the sex. Um, and also it's kind of, I'm not sure that uh, developers necessarily know where, you know, gameplay should end and cutscenes should take over. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, I've, like I said, I've not played Mass Effect, but, but how did you feel about it? I know that's got quite a lot of cu- sex scenes in it, and it seems that they're done sort of... Are, are they cringeworthy? Are they done quite tastefully? Or It depends on them. Some are fairly tasteful, because, frankly, they're barely sex scenes in the first place, mm-hmm. and then some are, frankly, ridiculous. And I think that perhaps Bioware's maybe made the best effort at building relationships between the protagonist and you as the player and some of the side characters and there are people that genuinely begin to care about these characters because they're they're well written enough to make that happen but simultaneously the gameplay particularly dragon age had a big problem with this when you are romancing romancing characters you would be giving them gifts which would give you certain points on the romance (laughs) meet i'm like god damn it this is the most contrived nonsense i could possibly imagine so it's they're tr- but I'll give them credit. Bioware are trying. They are trying. Yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and as you said, it's, it's down to the characters and the relationships and the writing. So, like, it seems like if those relationships and characters are believable, then, like, the sex is a little bit more believable. Sure. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I kind of feel there's so much more we have to get right and until, until that point, really. Um... And also, you know, Americans get very upset about nipples. That always seems to be a, a, <laughs> yes. a rating thing. Like, they would be fine with heads being that? chopped off, but if anyone shows a nipple, oh my god. It's Disaster. Kind of Someone like... please think of the children in this M-rated yeah. <laughs> game. Hang on a minute. This, they shouldn't be playing it in the first place. That seems a little odd. Yeah. Well, we, we could talk about uh, Americans' prudishness for, <laughs> till the end of time, but I know you have a lot of things to do. I'd like to wrap up with one last question that's sure. a bit more of a fun one because uh, it lets your imagination kind of go wild a little bit. Now, if you were given an infinite budget and free reign to write whatever video game protagonist you wanted, I'd like to know, just off the top of the head, what sort of character would you like to create? Um, I'm really interested in... Uh women in the military in particular and, and um, their experiences uh, and, you know, actually in the military through the ages. Um, I mean, I, I think maybe I didn't play it, but Velvet Assassin, Velvet Assassin may have touched on this, but they've been... It tried. Unfortunately, it wasn't very good. Yeah, that like there's been... Um, I think uh, the lady is Nancy Wake, who um, was one of the most decorated uh, female officers of... I, um, I think it was World War II. Um, I may have to just Google that. Uh, and she she was a, a, one of the, the um, Britain's most decorated female spies, basically. Yeah, she was a British, a- British agent, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and she was sort of incredibly glamorous as well. Like, she looked like a movie star. But, you know, there, there was a great um, quote about, her, you know, how, how kind of ferocious she was on the battlefield and kind of how like no nonsense she was and I, I found that sort of really um intriguing and you know as i say i like to i'd like to see a, you know a mother you know a mother character um and think kind of a, a you know maybe could, that could be combined combined in the sort of like a uh a, you know, a, a mom who is in the military I know there are plenty of um mums that are in the military at the moment and, and serving in all areas of the military uh, and so that is quite interesting to me, I think, um, and uh, under those sort of st- extreme circumstances. So she, yeah, N- Nancy Wake was um, uh, British agent in, in World War Two, and you know, if you if you Wikipedia her, you know, she looks actually she, she looks like a film star or everyone's granny. She looks a lot like my granny, which is uh, <laughs> well, at, at, at that age, which might be why it's appealing. And um, I think kind of real world. Uh, women can be kind of really inspirational for that kind of thing. Um, I think there would be. Uh, I, I you know I love um, Mary Shelley for example. Um, I I wrote a dissertation on on Frankenstein when I when I was at university and I was um, I did a lot of research in, into Mary Shelley and I feel kind of a, a certain kinship with her because you know we both have uh, author fathers <laughs> um, to to kind of deal with and. 
you know, she was sort of fascinated in, in science and technology. Um, and, uh, you know, she traveled a lot, which was fairly unprecedented. So I think there's some really interesting real world women. So yeah, maybe some kind of combination of, um, uh, you know, a female character in the military who is a mom and somehow also Mary Shelley. I don't know if Mary Shelley entered the military, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a Mary Shelley, uh, you know, d- demon hunter type of character. I think I'm Call just of describing Duty, Mary a really... Shelley. I would, yeah. I would play that game. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm just describing a really bad Hollywood movie, but yeah, I think there's a lot of real world inspiration that, um, can, you know, can be used. And, you know, like I said, if, if women are, are coming onto the front lines in the real world, then we really need to up our fantasies more. Yep. Certainly could not agree more <laughs> with that one. Well, Rihanna, thank you very much for taking so much time to give us such a detailed interview today. Hopefully that was very enjoyable for those listening. It was certainly uh, great for me to listen to. And again, big thanks for taking so much time out of your busy schedule for that. Before I sign off, is there anyone that you or any project that you'd like to make people aware of or just give a, a thanks or shout out to before we end the show? Um, well, unfortunately, there's, there's, I'm doing uh, three projects at the moment, two of which I can't talk about. Yes. But you, you know who you are out there, guys, if you're listening. So I'm really enjoying working with you. You're fabulous. Uh, and of course, there is uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider, which I'm, I'm working on with uh, Crystal. So, you know, um, big love and big shout out to the narrative team at Crystal who are... Uh, Noah Hughes and Joel Stafford, who worked on the first game with me, and um, also uh, Cameron Sui as well, who's a narrative designer on it. And we've we've also got some a few kind of bits and pieces of help along the way. So it's a it's a, a bigger narrative team, and I think it, it's it's better for it. But you know, they, those guys have been great to work with. Fantastic, Rihanna. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name has been Total Biscuit, an interview with uh, Rihanna Pratchett in regards to the writing of female characters, diversity, and all manner of other things here on the channel. Please remember to click the like button, favorite, and share this video if you enjoyed it. Of course, if you did, there will be more of them. Simple as that. That's how the market works. Thanks for listening, folks, and I'll see you next time.